no, the marketing campaign, sorry. Um, yeah, they managed to increase their daily sales by over 60% each day, um, which was incredible. Um, so that was really good. And then, so this year has kind of um, taught me a lot really with seeing so many businesses having to turn to social media and other forms of creating sales because there's no high street um, and the business they once had no, it can no longer exist. They, there's no grounds for their business that they used to have before this year. Um, so it kind of got me thinking um, after seeing a number of local businesses really using their initiative to drive their sales, I thought, how about I use my own initiative and try and help these small businesses grow their own social media? Because if I can do that with one, um, how about I try and help some others to do the same things and help them really achieve the sales that they deserve through their social media accounts if they just had the right guidance. Um, so I've been working with a number of um, small businesses now for the past six months to try and see if I could help them grow into the same ways and um, it's been working. So yeah, it's kind of, I want to kind of share that with as many people as I can. Um, yeah. I think that's everything. <laughs> Sorry, I think that went on a bit longer than I thought. Um, no, that's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, um, Zoe. And it's it's beautiful to know that that social media just work, does work. And with that in mind, we wanted to give everyone the opportunity to win a ticket for our next event. And I just want you to take a minute or two now to just share a story on Instagram. So the story can be absolutely anything. It can be a photo of you. It can be, you know, like your cup of coffee, your glass of Prosecco, however you're enjoying this event, your notebook and tag at herewegrow.smc. That's Zoe's new business account and my profile at orlab.coach as well. And tomorrow we're going to go through everything and we're going to pick a winner and they will get a free ticket to our next event as well. So if you can get cracking with that, because I know everyone multitasks at this, that would be amazing. Um, Zoe, would you like to tell us what to expect? Yeah, sure, of course. So um, basically what you can expect from um, this session is um, Orlef is going to talk you through um, some key things that are vital to help what I'm going to tell you actually work. Um, so she's going to be talking to you about how to generate um, unshakable confidence in you and your message. Um, along with what you really need to become oversubscribed and generate the sales that you want within your business. Um, and then from there, I will move on to uh, share some tips on how you can create an engaging Instagram account um, that really does stand apart from the crowds so that you can basically promote your business in the best way that's, uh, that's for you. Um, and then share some tips on how you can generate sales from that. Um, thank you so much, so much, Zoe. And basically, we'll do all this through a four-step framework, creating an authentic message, becoming oversubscribed, using those to create and engage an Instagram account and to grow your Instagram followers to your desired number. Um, but before we start, I wanted to invite you all to come on a trip to Paris with me. So just for a second, imagine that I told you to pack your passport and your sense of adventure, and I said, we're off to Paris together. And you were like, absolutely fucking brilliant let's go you were starting to imagine the Eiffel Tower all the hunky Frenchmen the gorgeous food everything and I took you to a cafe and I opened up Google Maps and I went down into Street View and I said look that's where the Eiffel Tower is that's where the Champs-Élysées is that's where my French is really bad but that's where the Louvre is that's where absolutely everything is you would feel hard done by and you'd probably be like are you absolutely shitting me but yet, this is what happens so many times when we learn something new. And this is what happens so many times when we're forced with that we have to do work on our business, is that we have this no culture. And this no culture has been given to us. And we go, I know that. I know that. And we don't take action. And the biggest problem that's holding many business women back is that they already know it. So they know where Paris is, they've looked at Google Maps, they've seen all the streets, they've gone onto Street View, but they've never been to Paris, i.e. they're not doing it. And if you don't do the work and if you don't visit Paris, you don't get to reap all of the benefits. 
And the second biggest problem is that we want a magic pill. But we don't really want a magic pill because we wouldn't trust one. But we're constantly sold magic pills in every other area of our lives from, you know, love, romance, weight loss, cookery, like absolutely everything. People are looking for fast, instant results, but we know they don't work. So I am challenging you today when you see something and you go, OK, I already know that it's to ask yourself, am I doing it? And when you're tempted to say, oh, God, this is too much hard fucking work. I'm going to ask you if I told you give me five thousand pounds and you would grow your Instagram followers tomorrow to fifteen thousand, would you believe me? And um, so that's me waxing lyrical because I really want this to be successful. Zoe really wants this to be successful, and the more businesses that grow, that that earn more money, that are fantastic, the less pressure there's going to be on the world. And um, Gemma and I have this conversation all the time that women need to make more money. Women need to be more successful. We need to be the breadwinners because there's lots of single moms watching this today and the other moms that aren't single it's that you deserve it and you absolutely deserve a successful business and small deeds done are better than great deals planned so take on board what works in this masterclass but whatever you take on board commit to taking action and um, so let's dive right in there about creating a compelling business message and becoming oversubscribed so when it comes to a message, what we want to do is we want to do something that connects with your customer. Lots of times when we start to market something and we start to promote something and it doesn't stick or customers aren't interested or people don't want to take it further, we start to think that there's something wrong with us or we start to think there's something wrong with the product or service. And when it doesn't connect, our instant reaction is to lower our prices or to take a step back and say, well, actually, it's me maybe I'm doing something wrong, maybe I need to do something different, when the truth is you don't, what you need to do is acknowledge that what if the problem wasn't the product, what if the problem was the way that we talked about the product or the service, and if we change how we talk about something, if we change how we talk about our business so that we're more engaging, we stand for something, we connect more with our customers, we're much more likely to build strong relationships and a tribe of customers, and that means we're much more long, likely to build a successful business. So the four steps to creating a compelling message that connects with your customers is number one is knowing what your message is. Number two is jumping in and knowing what you stand for. That's a really tricky one. And I get asked all the time, should I bring my personal beliefs, what I stand for as a human into my business? And should I hold off? And the short answer is yes. The long answer is so long as they're value based and they're in line with what your customers stand for as well. And we're going to have examples. And um, we want you to distill your message down into the four things. So what four key content pillars so that you can start to build your content for your social media. And we're going to look then at the purpose of your content. So let's dive straight in there about what is a message. And it's a strap line that clearly describes you and what you offer so that your customers will immediately know what you bring to the table and how they can work with you. It offers clarity and a way for them to connect with you and your business. I have to be 100% honest with you, doing this gift guide has been an eye opener for me. I would never have included this content in this presentation if I was making it a month ago, because I would have thought everyone knows this, like a message is the basics, like it's so obvious. And then I realized that's me being complacent and me being a bit of a dick, because what I've learned is it's hard and it's hard to message yourself and it's hard to create that strap line. But if a customer logs onto your website or they log onto your social media or they open your newsletter, they need to associate you with that sentence. They need to associate you with what exactly you offer. If they don't, they're just going to be confused. Now, remember, when people log onto your website, they're not sitting at their computer going, I've got all day. They're queuing in Tesco's. They're at the school gates. They're super busy. So you need to connect with them. Now, I've used one of my favorite examples here, and it's Snag and um, Snag tights. We've created Snag for one simple reason. We believe that anyone who wants to wear tights should be able to have tights that genuinely fit in comfort, regardless of size, shape, age or gender. Fuck me. Like that just says it straight away. And if you go on, if we go a bit deeper, that 
size, shape, age, or gender that really represents what snags stand for. And like when you go onto their social media, you'll see men model in tights, which I never see on any other clothes brand. And you'll see like every size represented and every size celebrated and championed. Um, and in case you're thinking, okay, it's just snag, I want you to guess the strap line. So I'm going to see if Zoe, can you check the comments while we're doing this? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so can you type in the comments? Who knows the answer to this one? Melts in your mouth and not in your hands. Karen Brown raised her hand. What's Karen saying? Helen. Lovely. This is amazing. Who's getting M&Ms? Everyone knows that. M&M, that lovely hard shell and that delicious chocolate. Um, it does exactly what it says on the tin. This would be lovely if I could do any DIY. Lee, Josefa's raised their hand. You know what we're talking about today. Um, Ron Seal, um, because you're worth it. Everyone knows those lovely Alison, Norma, Carmen. Oh, this is a good one, Josefa, Aoife. This, Susan, everyone's raising their hand. This is probably more of a of an obvious one, Pia, thank you, and um, that's L'Oreal, and a new one, uh, one of a relatively new business, but it's used as a massive example for modern marketing, shave time, shave money, and that's the Dollar Shave Club. If you're not familiar with how they've grown and how they've developed and how they've used marketing, check out their videos on YouTube and check out their social media. So when you're trying to create your own strap line, the first thing that I want you to think is what strap lines resonate with me? You know, for me, the snag tights resonated with me because it goes really deep. So have a think about like when you look at something, what resonates with you so you can use that as inspiration to create your own and to go from there. So I want you to create your message and create a tagline that connects. So if you can get out your pens and paper and go, I help, and I want you to list your customer, achieve, so what they achieve, so the benefits of what using your product or service, and then the so that. Now the so that is key. The so that is the knock-on effect in the rest of their life. The so that is how their life transforms because of your product or service. So if I was to do it um, for even snag, you know, like if we were to rewrite that, you know, I help women and men of all shapes and size achieve the perfect fit of tights so they can, they can live their lives with comfort, with joy. You know, it's, it's about expansion. So can everyone do that? And when you have it completed, can you raise your hand so that we know everything's done? Alison, oh, I know. I, do you know, Alison, I guess you were going to be one of the first to raise your hand because you've been promoting yours beautifully. Helen, thank you. If I don't name anyone there, I'm raising their hands. It's because I can't see it. Um, Susan, Nye, Pia, thank you. And um, for anyone who's doing this and you think I've done this before, Josefa, Vicky, Natalie, Amanda, I want you to ask, is it clearly displayed? So yes, you have your strap line. So my next question for you is, are you consistently using that strap line? Are you using it in your blog posts? Are you using it on your website? Is it displayed everywhere? Um, I follow an amazing coach and her strap line is faith in action equals miracles. And she signs off every email with that. Meg, yes. Karen, yes. Simona, brilliant. Um, Emma's ready. Rosie's done. Fantastic. She signs off every email with that. So she she reminds us of it through repetition so for people to know what you stand for and people to understand that message it has to be clear but you have to use it through repetition as well wendy's on the ball lucy thank you and um, thank you to everyone so that's step one so step one and you've been confident is you having a message you have a strap line that you can share and now we want to expand out on that and this is so important and it's like what do you stand for you know when I'm chatting about this with clients, they usually come back with, why do I need to stand for something? Like, can't I just have a generic website, a generic Facebook, keep me as a person completely different to my brand because that's just what I want to do. Like, I don't have the courage or the confidence or the know-how to put myself out there. But I'm gonna talk you through why this has changed from a consumer's perspective. And I want you to think about the consumer in building your brand. And to remember that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. And there's three, there's three key reasons why consumers care about what you stand for. 
So it's not me saying that you should do it because it's a good idea. It's this is what consumers expect. And number one is considered consumption. Number two is the desire to make a difference. And number three is the search for the genuine. And if they're new terms to you, I'll talk you through them just now. Um, so when it comes to considered consumption, I want you to get your head around the idea that consumers are increasingly holding brands to account for their actions and seek to have connections with the makers of their products and the creators of their services. So what this basically means for you as a business is that you have to stand for something and tell your story. You have to talk about what drove you to start to your business. You have to talk about why you're different and what you care about. Now, we started to first see this come to prominence maybe about 10 or 15 years ago when people start to talk about like uh, fair trade products, you know, um, slave free products. Like the fact that that's even something we talk about in 2020 is ridiculous. But people want to do good when they purchase and they're starting to think about it more. And they're starting to ponder on it. And if people can't clearly say this is what we do and this is why we do it, um, they're going to walk away. And um, I want you to consider, um, I don't know if you remember recently, it was, I think it was um, Audi. It was Audi. They had a massive advert out and they were talking about how women can do absolutely everything and women can rule the world and women can change the world. And they were really, really trying to get people to think that Audi was this company that promoted women when actually the women in their company earned statistically less than women in other companies of that size and in that industry. So they weren't so people started to hold this brand to account and people started to say well actually hang on a second you're here running adverts about women being able to change the world but you aren't paying your women what other car companies are paying your women and they really really stood up to them so from your perspective i want you to tell your story what inspired you to start your business what's going on in the world that you don't agree with and how you want to change it the second is that people desire to make a difference. Consumers want to make a difference in the world and they expect their brands they choose to help them do so. And this is really about becoming a for purpose business. Now, a for purpose business can range from, you know, Tom's shoes, where it's like, you know, they make a pair, they sell a pair of shoes and they donate one to charity, to I have a client who is given a percentage of every sale starting from you know the start of her this new initiative she's given a percentage of every sale to charity so she can promote that and she can attract people into her business who want to make a difference and um, so if you are passionate about supporting your local food bank if you are passionate about supporting black lives matters and giving a voice to to businesses throughout the uk run by black people and people of color share those you know if you are passionate about a donation to charity helping your local schools donating at the local fairs whatever it is that has to form a part of your message because your customers now they really desire they desire this and you're a way of them doing it and we talk about like the power of the pound and the power of how they spend money and you're actually the route for them to do this and um, the next thing is the search for the genuine people are fed up of bullshit they're absolutely sick of it you know and we'll come across this about getting the balance right about a really fantastically beautiful instagram feed balanced with telling your story balanced with who you are as a person we want to buy from businesses that are open and honest and genuinely care you know so it's about looking at the intention behind your actions and purely taking an action for profit won't cut the mustard in the long term and it was actually Josepha who's on the call tonight that introduced me to the term greenwashing last year and um, we were at a mastermind and I didn't realize that so many businesses did that and they basically painted an environmentally friendly action over the ingrained destruction of the planet that they do as part of their business to talk about how they were good for the environment. We've seen this recently in the, um, the elections across the pond in America, whereby you know, people had to choose between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and they were desperately searching for somebody genuine and somebody to jump off. Um, industries where this is particularly, particularly important in is any coaching industries, um, any industries that offer support to businesses, product-based businesses, talking about where, um, where your products come from. Um, pretty much every business has to be genuine, has to be authentic, and talking people through your journey is a fantastic way to do that. So I want you to consider 
are you a brand that stands for something? And if you're squirming a bit now, you are a brand. You are an amazing shit hot business owner. That means you're building a brand. Um, so I want you to look at these traits and I want to ask yourself, do you understand what's important to your customers? Like, is it the environment? Is it, you know, looking after children? Is it Black Lives Matters? You know, what is behind the scenes? What is a value that they're passionate about? You know, really think about these things. And is that important to you? And if it is important to you, you can share that in your business. Um, do you take a side on something? Taking a side is something that most businesses are afraid to do. You know, they're afraid to say, actually, do you know what? I don't agree that we should eat animal products. I don't agree that um, we should use, you know, shampoos and conditioners that are tested on animals. I don't agree that we should give people like a strict idea of what they should eat as a health coach. You know, people are very afraid of this because they're afraid of who might be offended, who might not want to work with them. But you have to say, OK, this is my style. This is what I believe in as a business. And this is what I'm going to do. And um, that it's built into your values, you know, that you live and breathe the fact that you care about your customers and giving back is the most important thing to you. You know, and um, you want to send a clear message about how you care and that you stand for something and you want to create a movement. And you also want to stay tuned in and stay relevant. Now, I know some people are probably listening to this and think, OK, well, that's pretty big for me. But, you know, you could do this as a cake company. You could be like, well, I understand what's important to my business and what's important to my customers is that they get, you know, really amazing tasting cakes from products that are grown locally. You know, you might take a side and turn around and say, well, actually, I don't agree in feeding our kids with loads of sugar. I don't agree in contributing to the obesity crisis. I'm going to make, you know, low sugar cakes for um, kids. It's built into your values. You know, you constantly promote this as an option and um, you're not going to all of a sudden then start to promote cakes that are topped with Oreos when yours is a different business. You send a clear message, you donate a percentage to charity and you build a movement. So through your customers, through your social media, it's about community building. It's about, you know, talking and conversing with other people that also care about, you know, healthy, delicious taste and cakes using local ingredients. Um, and you stay relevant. You see if anything changes, you know, are there new things that my customers care about and how we can look at those. Yeah. And I'm going to share you my favorite brands that stand for something. And yes, ladies, you can thank me for the half naked picture of Joe Wicks. Absolutely. Anytime. And um, we'll start with Marcus Rashford. And I'm going to talk to him as a brand and not as a footballer, because lots of people think, OK, I'm a footballer. That's my brand. No, he is a brand himself. And if you think about what he stands for from, you know, playing football, you know, being absolutely top of his game. But alongside that, he stands for the idea that kids don't go hungry <laughs> during term time. He stands for the fact that every kid deserves a chance. And from his business, which is him as a brand, he's now writing kids books. He's partnered with Burberry. So he's expanding all of the ways that he can make money. Um, Tony Chocolati, I don't know if any of you follow them on um, social media, they're absolutely amazing. But what they stand for and what they really care about, um, we have some hands raised. Do you mind checking on that? Um, Zoe, is that okay? Is everyone okay? Just realised I've muted. Um, I can't see any hands raised. It's, it, I can see questions and answers and I can see chat, mm -hmm. but I can't see. Okay. Anyone who's raised their hand, do you mind popping in the q and if there's anything we can help with? Okay. I will keep going. Um, <laughs> Um, so Tony Chocolati, I don't know if I'm saying that right, if you find them on social media, what they care passionately about is let's make 100% slave free chocolate, the law. Um, Steampunk, if for those of you in North Berwick, during the summer, they were very open about supporting an oat milk brand that sold out to a big conglomerate and how they would continue to support local businesses and bring that into what they do. Um, so the third thing when it comes to creating a compelling message is what you stand for. So when sharing your message, you know, you've got your strap line, you stand for something bigger. You always want to ask yourself, what four things does my customer need to know about me to know that I'm the right person to do business with them? 
And these will form the pillars of your content on social media. So they'll form the backbone from which you can get all of the amazing ideas for posts. You can get all the amazing ideas for lives and stories. So I wanna ask you now, does everyone, can everyone take a second to write down what four things? So if I was a potential customer of yours, what four things do I need to know about you to know that you're the right person to do business with? Um, so if we were to look at maybe like, I'll pick like Starbucks as a coffee shop, what four things, you know, we've got a wide range of coffee, we're easily accessible, you can use the app and you can sit in for hours you know, and they're kind of like the four things that they could expand out when sharing their business. Um, for myself, what four things is I like to talk about um, how, you know, mindset really matters when you're building a business. And it's also the balance between your business and your life, uh, taking aligned action, and also like holding yourself accountable as well. So have a think about those. Yeah. And the last thing you need to know is when you're creating a compelling message is the purpose of your content. So you have a strap line, that's your clear message. You know what you stand for. So there's something bigger than you. You're not afraid to share your values. You're not afraid to share who you are as a person. You know the four pillars. So what four things my customer needs to know about me to know I'm the right person to do business with them. And the fourth thing is you can change how you deliver your content depending on what you want to achieve. So you can take one concept and you can share it in different ways across social media, in your newsletter, um, whatever you are doing to market yourself. So you can take the concept that is you, you use local ingredients and you can use that to build relationships. You can use it to build authority. You can use it to generate engagement, inspire people to take action. So I have got an example of this. So let's say one of my content concepts, one of my four pillars was that I was environmentally friendly. And I wanted to use that piece of content in three different ways. I want to use that content to build authority. I want to use that content to generate engagement on my social media. And I wanted to use that content to build relationships. So how I can do that, if I wanted to build authority by demonstrating I'm environmentally friendly. I could share stats, useful information on the impact of what you do in the environment. Um, you could share stats on you just waking people up to what's going on. I went to buy um, soap recently and I saw that, you know, when we use traditionally plastic packaging, we um, consume a credit card size of um a credit card size of plastic every week. You know, so that's building authority, that's demonstrating that you know about the environment. If you wanted to use environmentally friendly to generate engagement, you could ask clients questions about the environment as it relates to your product or service. So you could start asking them, like, did you know how many gallons of water it takes to produce this? You know, did you know how much plastic you save by using our product? Um, did you know um, how we, we don't travel, you know, so there's no air miles, you know, you can use that and you can ask them questions. And um, if you want to use it to build relationships, you can donate to charity in your customers' names. You can give a shout out to your customers who are making a difference and reducing their, you know, plastic consumption, you know, reducing um, their carbon footprint, whatever they're doing in terms of a difference. So the second way, so the first way, that I want to talk you through on how to, you know, become authentic in your marketing was to have that compelling message to stand for something and to know how you're going to share it. The second thing, and this is so important and it's, it's absolutely fucking crucial is that you commit to becoming oversubscribed. And that when you were marketing yourself, when you were growing your Instagram following, when you were growing your social media following, when you are presenting people with the opportunity to buy, your aim is always to get people lining up to do business with you. That is all. Your aim is not to become the most known photographer in all of the UK. Your aim is not to become the most known VA throughout Europe. You know, your aim is not to become an influencer. Your aim is to get enough people buying from you. That is all. And I think when we engage in marketing, when we engage in social media, we think our aim is to take over the world and that can paralyze us, that can stop us taking action. 
So the four ways that we can get people lining up to do business with us, get more people wanting to do business with us that we can work with, you know, build, build a strong customer base is first, it's outsmarting demand and supply. Second is knowing that your people and only your people matter. The third is that you create the right conditions to buy. And the fourth is that you create a sales train. And that's basically it. That is how you get people lining up to do business with you. That is how you can sell out events quicker. You can get fully booked quicker. And that is how you can really use your Instagram to help you do this. So I want to ask you a question. Which one of these products would you rather sell? Would you rather sell? You can raise your hand when you have decided, because I think I know the answer. Would you rather sell and make a profit from a um, paperclip that costs £290? Or would you rather sell one that costs 167 Susan, I think I know which one you are going for. Carmen, Rosie, Thea, Karen, Liz, yes, Nye, Meg, Lucy, this is great. And this is great. I know I haven't lost anyone either. Of course, we're all going to say, I, as a business owner, I would rather sell a £290 product versus one that costs 167 And straight away, basic math, two and 190 is 145. I need 145 times more customers to sell that product at 167 But yet what happens is most of us approach our marketing like we're competing on price. Most of us approach our marketing like we're doing a massive land grab and our job is to bring as many people into our social media as possible and that's our only job when we're not actually thinking about, okay, how can I compete on value? How can I not be a commodity in the marketplace? And that is what is absolutely essential. Now, the next thing I want to ask you is, who would you rather star in your next movie? Would you rather have Tom Hardy or this equally handsome man that I've taken off Shutterstock? Rosie, I think you're a Tom fan, are you? <laughs> Aoife, Nye, Carmen, Suzanne, every, Wendy, Meg, Hattie, Liz. Yes, Gemma. We would all want Tom Hardy to star in our movie, but we don't know what their skill set is. We don't know who's better at their job here. Is it Tom Hardy or is it this rather handsome man here on the right? The only thing that we know is that their success is not dependent on their ability. Their success is dependent on the fact that they have created a market for themselves like Tom has. They have not brought themselves out onto the market. And that's what I want you to consider doing, that you use your social media, you use your Instagram to create a market for your products or services, as opposed to taking a step back and just go, well, how can I just release me to the world? Let's use our Instagram, let's use our social media to become the Tom Hardy in our industry, rather than an unknown who could be equally as good as what he does, who could be amazing, who could be given to charity, who could stand for something, but he hasn't created a market and I'm gonna show you how. So the first question, if you're gonna create a market for yourself is I want you to answer honestly, how many customers can you work with? So if you're a product-based business, write down how many products do you need to sell over the next three, six, nine months to sell out? If you're a service-based business, how many clients can you work with until you're fully booked? And I don't want you to think of anything else. That's all you need to know is you want to become fully booked and have a waiting list. You don't want to concern yourself with anything else at this stage. You can have your plan for the future, but your aim right now in your marketing is to become fully booked. And we want to adjust your marketing to create this reality. And we do this by focusing on your people and only your people. Now, Zoe is going to knock our socks off with examples on how to do this. But it's only your people that matter. It's only your customers. It's not your competitors. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, whether you're competitors or not, we're all doing our fucking best in this world. It's not customers that we're never going to buy from you. It's not somebody at school that might be following you on Facebook that really is in your target market. Just block them. I'm begging you, block them. Um, you should only care about the people that matter to you and that is your customers. And your aim when we're following Zoe's lead is to create seven hours of content, 11 meaningful interactions across four locations. 
And why are we doing that? Because by doing that, we build relationships. And when we build strong relationships with people, they will pay more for what we do. When we build strong relationships with people, they will choose us. They won't go anywhere else and they will stick with us. And in order to worship your people and champion your audience, you have to give vanity metrics the finger. <laughs> we don't care. It's not about how quickly can I get to X amount but not look after. When Zoe talks is what, we, what she did, she always attracted her target market. She always attracted the people that were right for her business. And in order to do that, you have to forget about what people that aren't your customers are and stop trying to be famous or stop getting put off. If you look at a competitor and you think they've got way more followers, you cannot be put off by that. That's not what matters. The metrics that you need to be measuring first and foremost is your profit, your sales, the impact, and the things that help you create those. So the growth in your social media, the growth in your click-through rates. When you do this, you create your own market and you get paid based on value. So if we look at the Tom, is his name Tom Hardy? I'm not calling the wrong person. If you look at that example, what did he do? He created his own market as an actor. You know, he stood out from the crowd. He looked after the people that came to his films. And, you know, he looked after us mums when he read on um, <clears throat> CBBS at nighttime. You know, it's you have to create your market so that you get paid based on volume but you also have to commit to become famous to these people you want to be famous for a few you know you don't want to be famous to millions but you want to lead your followers you want to be a shining example to them you want to share what matters to you and you want to be consistent um, the third way that you can become oversubscribed i.e you have people lining up to do business with you the right number is that you create the right conditions for customers to buy from you and that's really essential. And it's important to remember that people don't buy what others want to sell. They buy what others want to buy. Because when we see other people purchasing, that becomes a reflection of us, you know? And a really easy way to do that is to start consistently sharing testimonials. But more than just sharing a testimonial to champion your customers, to talk about their achievements, to talk about how amazing they are, to to thank them. That's a fantastic way to demonstrate to potential customers that you're already working with people like them. I want you to stop, to consider about stopping available to purchase all year round, to have seasonal products, to have seasonal campaigns. If you never have an end date, if you never have a reason to act now, if you're always available all year round, there's no reason for people to take action. You know, that's why we have Cadbury's cream eggs. That's why we have the Starbucks red cups. That's why we have end dates. You know, don't be afraid to be sold out and um, embrace saturation points. You know, you should be fully booked. You know, people, we, we have this thing whereby we hold back and we don't say that we're fully booked, but you should be fully booked. Um, people don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. So it's really important. You might think that people need to know this, but you have to sell what people want and you have to then package up what they need along with it. Because if you just give them what they want, it probably wouldn't be what's best for them, but give them what they need alongside of it. And that's where your expertise comes in. And that's where you absolutely shine. Um, a few examples of limited edition. Bruce Springsteen, my absolute angel. Um, has anyone noticed how people create the conditions to buy when it comes to concerts? Um, have you ever noticed like anything from the theater, anything of that realm? You know, do you think Bruce Springsteen's diary is empty? <laughs> like for like a week that you can tell them last minute, we need to do a concert. No, they release the first date. They get people on in a frenzy. They get people all flurried. They get them to buy. And then they release the second and the third date. But they all always knew they were doing those three dates. Cadbury's cream egg out between January and Easter. And obviously they get more sales then than they would if it's available all year round. Um, and the Starbucks red cup. So start to look at businesses that encourage you to act now. Start to look at businesses that get you moving and go from there. Um, and the last thing is to create a sales train and you signify the shops. So I want you to think of your marketing as like a train track. 
and it's going round and you've got different stops where you can bring people on. So you can you bring people onto your sales train, onto your social media by getting social media followings. You can bring people onto your email list by getting that indication of interest. And then once they're on the sales train, once you're worshiping them, once you're looking after them, you can then sell to them. You know, you can use this in interest to generate a buzz and then you follow up. So if right now you want to take on more clients on social media and you want to get more followers on Instagram, alongside that to nurture your train and to look after your clients you also have to be using an email list you also have to be following up and making sure that you have got upsells and that you're selling to the same customers as well and that's when you get way more customers not just who are the new customers it's having a train and thinking okay I bring them on they're interested I sold to them once I'll sell to them twice three times four times and then always present them with opportunities to buy from you it's not a case of oh I have a client once but then I'm going to get a new client that would be absolutely exhausting for you so guys, we're finished my part of the presentation and I want you to take a couple of minutes to consider how many customers do you need over the next three, six or nine months to be maxed out. Now answer this based on what your current plans are. If you've already got plans for the next six months, I want you to tell me how many customers you need over the next six months and then work your way back. How many engaged followers do you need to achieve these sales? You know, think about like Zoe will be able to give us a better figure about the, the ratios, but you want to punch above your list. You know, we've sold out this event at over 30 tickets based on 2000 engaged followers in the Facebook group, you know, so think about it that way. And how can you create the right conditions to buy? And um, if you've got any questions of this at the end, I can answer, but I'd love you to raise your hand once you've answered these questions. Susan is done. Yes. I'm, it's always lovely when you see the first hand because then you're thinking, okay, this is good. Carmen is done. Lee is done. This is fantastic. Natalie, Liz, Nye, Gemma, and Amanda, Vicky, fantastic. And I want you to consider this during the next part of the presentation. I want you to consider the number of engaged followers and the activities you're going to take. And I want you to consider always know what your sales figures are. Helen's got an idea. That's amazing. Um, okay, that is all for me. I'm going to pass you over to the absolutely amazing Zoe and she's going to take it um, from here. Okay, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically I'm going to share some tips um, on how um, not only can you sort of put start to put the things that all of us said into practice, um, um, and some other tips basically to make your Instagram more engaging and more appealing to your target audience um, and then go on to generate sales. Um, because as all of us saying, the number of um, followers you have, it's not the most reliable source for you to bring in um, the sales. What you need to do is you really need to make those connections with your following um, and your customers in order to then for them to then go on and trust you um, and buy from you. Um, so there are definitely ways of doing that. So I'll go on. Um, all if I don't know. Ah, it's let me do it. That's fine. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I didn't dare check whilst you were doing yours in case it, <laughs> it changed your slide. Um, so basically, yeah, um, you need to think about what's going to make your Instagram account magical, what's going to make your Instagram stand out from your competitors um, and just in general, what's going to make people know that the posts you're posting are your posts when they're scrolling through a feed of thousands of other businesses that are posting at the same time. Um, and that's working out how you can get in front of potential customers in new ways, thinking up new content ideas. Um, and then from there, you need to be building relationships with them um, so that they can then go on to spread the word for you. Um, that's always a great way is using your customers to support you. Um, 
and then generate the sales and become oversubscribed. Um, and doing that in an authentic way that is um, not requiring you to use paid adverts and things like that. Um, not changing. I'll do it for you. Ah, cheers. <laughs> Um, so yeah, create an engaging uh, and engaging an Instagram account. So we're going to break it down into um, there's basically four key areas. In this section, we're going to be talking about branding and consistency. Um, so I'm going to get you to click again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, your branding is really important. So when you're thinking about your branding, you really need to think about what you want your customers. Um, to, to know about you, um, what your brand persona is, um, how that reflects in your business as a whole with everything that you're doing, not just on social media, but um, in everything, every aspect of your business. And that needs to come across very clearly. So when people visit your social media account, they can see right from the off who you are, what you stand for, um, and pick up on the general vibe of your account. Um, and that also so people can connect with you right from the off um, if people come onto your account and they can't clearly see who you are what you're doing or why you're there they'll probably most likely head off and go away from you um, so if you can intrigue them and get them to stay right from the beginning that's that's what you're that's what you're trying to achieve um, so i'm just gonna get you to click again <laughs> Yeah, so basing the, the basics for your branding are to think about your logo. Um, and if you've already got a logo, make sure that that is present on your account um, in everything that you're doing so that people become familiar with your logo and who you are um, and sharing that everywhere. So you can use it in your stories, use it as your icon um, on your profiles. Um, and share it in your posts from time to time too. And then from there, try and link in your overall color palette to your logo. So the whole thing matches and ties in. Um, use it in your banners and in your stories. Have a font that you stick to and that you use all of the time. Um, this helps. Um, I know stories is difficult because you have to use the, the fonts that are available but, but when you're using your stories try and stick to the same kind of font every single time and um, so that there's a, a, a flow basically that comes across everywhere that they're looking at anything on your accounts um, so that when they are on your accounts they are familiar with you <laughs> um, and then yeah rolling that out across everything that you're doing so that your business becomes recognizable um, no matter where people are looking at you from so that can be so if you had it like a youtube went on to do a youtube channel or you went on to go onto twitter or pinterest everything would flow and if people caught you on there they would know that was you um yeah and the best thing the best way to do this is to have branding guidelines um and this is not only handy for you, but if your business grows and you've, you've got team members um, and you're having them share content for you, the, the branding guidelines are really, really handy because they make you stick to the guidelines um, and they keep you on track so that you don't slip away from it. Um, so when you're making your branding guidelines, write down what font you're using, the size of the font, how big you want your logo to be on the post, if there's a specific place on post that you want your logo to sit, write every single detail down so that when um, it comes to sharing posts, you can refer back to your guidelines and see if the post that you're sharing matches the guidelines. And if it doesn't, then you can change it to match so that you know that each time you're putting out a post, it is exactly as it should be. And then what will happen is your grid will become a nice steady flow of your branding um, without you having to have had to do too much work to try and make that happen. Um, yeah, I think that's everything on that bit. Yeah, so um, when it comes to other areas of branding, um, 
having specific hashtags that you use within your posts um, and within your account, um, basically, as Olaf was saying earlier, to create a movement. Um, so when people, people relate those hashtags to you and they will use them in the things they're sharing about you too. Um, so they become, so they can't, you kind of own it. Um, I think there's an example I'm going to, I'll, you know, I'll wait for the examples, otherwise we're going to have to skip. Um, but yeah, basically share that on every single post. So for me, I use my own name, Meals for Minnie Mouse, um, and I use that hashtag on every single post as a way for people to relate that to me. Um, and then, yeah, you coming up with your own that are relevant to you. Um, Sorry, I've lost my throat. Um, <laughs> so your branding is important as well because it's like your shop front. So um, within social media, um, I think the best, I've been using this one a lot, but if you try and see social your social media accounts as your shop front for every single scenario that you can think of, um, it really, really helps you to kind of see the benefit of it and to treat it with, as though it's a part of an important part of your business. Um, so when you look at your Instagram account as a whole, try and see it as though it's a shop front and how would you like your shop front to look? Um, the other part of the shop front is the branding. So, you know, it needs to look really neat and tidy. Um, if you had a shop, and in a, on a high street um, and the logo you had on the outside of the shop didn't match the logo that was on your bags people would be a bit confused and they wouldn't really understand what your branding was so trying to keep everything flowing um, and everything the same really helps um, and yeah so it, it yeah it creates a consistent um, post look um, and that's what you need for your account is consistency throughout. Um, and then from that, that will really give you the stance to stand out from other businesses um, and your competitors. And the main part is that people will recognize your posts without even needing to click onto your profile. So when they're scrolling through their feed um, and they're seeing everybody else's businesses coming up and they're seeing posts from all of the other companies when they stop a, a lot across yours they will know that that is your post um, and hopefully hopefully from that they'll go on to share it um, and support you yeah so relating back to the hashtag thing um, when you're um, using hashtags and you want to own some the, the best one is using your own business name as a hashtag and using that on everything that you do. Um, you can even use it on, um, if you create any kind of flyers in, in your newsletters, literally share that hashtag everywhere. Um, not just on posts, but everywhere that you um, promote yourself. Um, the importance of that is that people will then tag you in things using that hashtag. Um, and it's a great way for you to be able to go into Instagram um, search the hashtag of your own business name and see if anybody has shared anything to do with your business um, because a lot of people don't use the tagging they see the hashtag as more important than the tagging um, so yeah it's a great way of ensuring that people are using a hashtag relevant to you um, the other one is like having specific hashtags that relate to your business so um for an example burt's bees uses change for nature as one of their hashtags on all of their posts um and it's relatable to everything that they do and everything they stand for as a brand so if you can have another hashtag that you own that's related to you know your the specifics of your business um that's really good as well because that can create a movement um and people will share that and use it um and i can't see the last one because <laughs> um yeah and when you are using hashtags on posts never use the same ones all the time the the importance of this is um basically when you're using the same hashtags on every single post um, you're not ever getting yourself into new areas um, of Instagram. 
or social media if you're using it on Facebook as well. So when you each time you post a post, try and use a variation of hashtags, try and use a number of hashtags you've never used before, uh, mixed with some that you use a lot, and then also adding in the ones that are specific to you and your brand and that you kind of own. Um, the reason why this is important is um, that that post will then be put into those hashtag areas. Um, and by using new ones all the time, you're constantly getting your posts into new target audiences constantly. Um, so you're able to drive business through the hashtags um, with every post that goes out. So the benefits uh, that, yeah, so if you're using the same hashtags all the time, you are never getting yourself into new target areas of the market. Um, and I think that's a big thing that lots of people try to get wrong is they copy and paste their hashtags from post to post. Um, and this is really not effective for their business because you're never, they're not giving your hashtags the best chance. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's everything. Oh, hang on. Should you always use the full 30? No, um, no, you don't need to use the full 30. Um, I think this is another thing that people stress over is they're trying to use the full 30. And by doing that, what they're doing is they are then going away from their target audience. Um, and going back to what Orlith was saying earlier, what you're doing when you do that is you may you may get new followers from it. But those people are very unlikely to buy from you. And that's really your goal is to have an engaging social media account where the followers that follow you are engaging with you. Um, they're there because they um, uh, believe in your business and hopefully are going to be buying from you. So you can use 30 if there's 30 that are relevant to you um, and that you can come up with about half of them that are new each time. But realistically, I think the best, um, and I've spoken to Olaf about this before, but the best kind of number is about 10, 10 to 15 is about enough um, because they are then your, the hashtags that you're using are then specific to your target audience. Um, and that's what you want. Um, you don't want anybody following you. You know, if you're using the hashtag Saturday, for instance, because you've posted on Saturday, that's not really having any relevance to you in your business. Um, and it's certainly not going to um, draw any potential sales in. Um, the only thing it might do is get you a like on that post, but it's not going to get you any more than that. Um, so try and keep your hashtag specific to what the post is about um, and what your business is about. Um, the order of the hashtags. No, the order of the hashtags doesn't matter um, because no matter what order they're put into, um, the post will just be slotted into that hashtag group. Um, so for instance, if it was Saturday, it'd go into a Saturday one, but then the next hashtag along was Tuesday, it'd go into Tuesday. So it really doesn't matter what order your hashtags are in. Um, any order's fine. <laughs> I always, oh, just for one thing, I always put my business, my, my business hashtag last. There's no real reason for it. It's just that it stands out clearer when the hashtags are all listed. Um, just so that it's like me signing off basically as me. Okay, so um, yeah, looking at branding overall, um, and these are some examples of good branding and bad branding. Um, so this is basically putting into practice everything that I've been saying. So if you look at the um, lovely pink one in the top left, um, that's a soap business. Um, you might know them, Soap and Glory. Um, and if you scroll through their grid, um, everything that they post is branded. It's in the colour, it's in the style of the photos, um, it's you can they show clearly show the products that they're selling throughout um, they've got their branding on a number of their products in the pictures they are really showing who they are so when you go go on to soap and glory you can see very easily who they are what their branding is and that that's their post if that post was to come up in a feed 
with a thousand other posts, you would know that that was soap and glory. Um, whereas the one on the right is another soap business. Um, and I, yeah, I really struggled to even know that they were selling soap. Um, so, you know, you, it's not very clear at all what their product is or what they're selling. Um, there's no branding there. If their post was to fall into a feed, I wouldn't know that that was them posting. Um, and again, if you look on the one on the bottom right, no, the bottom left, um, the, the company sells um, reusable uh, food pouches and the coloring is all the same. The style of the photos is very similar. Um, you can see their brand name from the pictures. You can see the products that they're selling. It's all very clear and it flows very nicely. Um, and the one on the right there is a, oh, there's a lot of questions now. <laughs> um, yeah, the one on the right is um, a, a, a business coach. Um, and I don't think it comes across at all because the, um, there's nothing there to kind of say what she does. Um, there's a few photos of her, but the actual branding, and I, I can't, can't really see it too well from the photo, but um, it kind of changes with each post. The text is different on each post. The layout is different on each post. Um, the things that she, the topics she's talking about varies greatly. Um, uh, so yeah, that you can't zone in on exactly what it is that she's trying to promote. Um, so yeah, clear branding. And I think that's the best example is showing the two side by side there. Um, I think it's very clear how you can achieve that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the second part of it is consistency. Um, and I think this pretty much come up in the branding, but consistency is like key. Um, and that's consistency within everything that you are doing as a business. And that's not just within social media. Um, consistency um, helps your business stay re yeah, recognizable um, and it stops customers being confused because say for instance, you were post you posted one week every single day um, and then you didn't post again for another two weeks. It's confusing for your business. Uh, it's confusing for your customers. Um, and they're not really sure if your business is there or if it's not there. The other consistency issue that's confusing is the branding. So if you're constantly changing your account look um, and your branding, it's going to be very difficult for people to know who you are and recognize you. Um, I'll get you to click to that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's um, when you're posting um, and there's been a lot of talk about this particular issue um, seems to be that people think they need to share posts um, on Instagram and Facebook differently um, because they need to that basically they think their audience is the same on both Instagram and Facebook. Um, I can pretty much assure you that people that are following you on Facebook are very unlikely to be following you on Instagram as well um, because People, there's different types of people. There's people that prefer Instagram and use Instagram. And then there's people that much prefer to use Facebook. So the two audiences you have um, on Instagram and Facebook, and it's the reason why I collate the followers into one as into one big group, um, because the followers that you have on Instagram and the followers that you have on Facebook are going to be two very different followings. They're going to be your target audience. Um, but they're going to be different people. So you, when you're looking at your overall count of following, you can add the two together and that's how many followers you have. Um, so when you're posting, whatever you share on Instagram is perfectly fine to be shared on Facebook as well. And I'd recommend it because you're, you're keeping the consistency there. Um, so if somebody does want to go and have a look at you on Facebook, say a friend has recommended to a friend, this friend uses Instagram, but this friend uses Facebook. So the friend that's recommended you has um, said, said to a friend, oh, go and have a look at this account. And this lady has then logged into Facebook to have a look at you and said to her friend, 
is this the right account? But if you've shared different content, she's not going to recognize that. And so was unlikely to make that connection. Um, so try and keep your two, your any social media accounts that you have, try and keep the, their uh, consistency there. Um, when you're posting as well, try not to favor one over the other. Um, I hear a lot where people say, oh, I, you know, I post on Facebook because that's where I get the most engagement, um, but I don't do anything with my Instagram account. Um, it's really important that you consistently post across both. Um, don't favor one platform more than the other. Try and keep posting on Instagram as much as you post on Facebook. Um, because by doing this, it might feel like your engagement is better on Facebook, but the reason why your engagement is better on Facebook is because you're posting there more often and you're engaging there more often. Um, so you're not giving Instagram any kind of chance. So you really have to give, give both your love. <laughs> um, yeah, keep your um, posting frequency consistent. Um, I know that some people say that they haven't got time to share. Um, so they post when it's convenient for them. Um, going on algorithms, algorithms like consistency, um, so if you know that you can only post three times a week, try and keep those three times a week to the same days um, because that's the consistency. So if you know that you've got way too much to do on a Monday um, and you've got way too much to do on a Sunday, don't post on those days um, and then post on the other days. Just basically post on the days that works for you, but try and keep them as consistent as possible um, because this will stop you falling into those dreaded algorithms <laughs> that we all have issues with. Um, yeah, I think that's everything on those. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna, sorry, yeah. Um, the consistency as well with what, you, what you're sharing. So <clears throat> I spoke about sharing on uh, consistent days um, or specific days. The other thing is when you're sharing stories, again, people do the same thing with story sharing. They tend to share when they've got something to share um, or they um, have a blast of it and when they're feeling motivated and then they come off and they don't post anything for a number of weeks. The problem with this is going back to the shop front um, idea um, is when people come to your account and they look at the last post you've posted and see that it was, I don't know, a week ago um, and you've got no stories buzzing in the corner, um, they're basically going to think that you're not around. Um, so if you, um, the best way to keep a consistent flow of posts is to one, stick to certain days, but with your story sharing, keep, um, collate a album full of stories that you can share and then gradually post those throughout the week. So for my own Instagram account, Meal Swinny Mouse, what I tend to do is um, there is no way I could post story. Uh, there's, my life's not that exciting. Um, so there is literally no way I could keep my stories exciting by sharing what we were doing every day because it would pretty much be me sat working with my son eating snacks watching telly seven hours of the day um so what i tend to do is um take photos during the week of things that we actually do um and basically that's built up over time and then i roll those out gradually um so that my story sharing stays a, like a constant flow um, so my stories are, there's always stories on my account. They're always spinning. So my, um, my account looks like I'm constantly there and I'm constantly engaged and I'm constantly ready to talk um, and to do business. Um, so yeah, try and see your um, account as your shop front and try and keep the consistency there by never allowing too many days to go between posts. Um, I'm trying to, I'm reading, sorry, <laughs> I've got myself, um, 
yeah so yeah using your so you can use your social media insights to so a lot of the time people ask me how do I know what I need to post um how do I know what appeals to my target audience um I posted a post the other day and it got 50 likes and then I posted another post and it got 10 why is this happening um and so the best way of of finding out what works is by posting a series of posts um, in different styles um, and seeing what the insights say, um, seeing what does well and what doesn't do well. And then whatever does do well, post more of that. It's not to say that the posts that don't do as well aren't important. Um, still keep sharing those, but try and add in as much as what people are wanting and why they are there. Um, so you will be able to figure that out basically on what the insights say. So if you've got a number of likes on one post, try and figure out what the style was, what the messaging was that you were sharing, what the post was about. Was it about um, you taking your dog for a walk and people liked it? Um, or was it a salesy type post, a new product? And basically try and post more of that. Um, because that's the way you'll keep your in, your audience interested is by posting the things that keep them um, engaging with you. Uh, there's a lot of questions. I don't know if I should, um, should I answer this at the end? Um, yeah, we're doing a Q and A at the end so we can get through all of the questions then. Yep, that's fine. Um, okay. So um, just for you to like write down now, um, if you want to sort of um, write down what is, oh, hang on, I can't see it. Um, how much time you're going to be spending or how much time you can realistically spend each day to schedule your content. Um, and from that, you'll be able to work out, I think that's what I mean. Um, you'll be able to work out um, so if you can say I can only dedicate four hours a week to scheduling my posts, um, work out how many posts you can create within those four hours, say you can create five posts in those four hours, that's how many posts you roll out a week. Um, so try and work it around what's going to work for you and what's realistic for you and your time um, and only commit yourself to what's do achievable. Um, so, you know, if you can, if you know that you're, you, you know, you're really busy and you actually only realistically have an hour, which means that you can only put out two to three posts a week, that's what you stick to, but then try and keep the days the same. Um, yeah, so if you write down um, four words that best describe what you want your customers to feel when they visit your profile. Um, the reason for doing this is if you've got, the words and you that's what you want them to be feeling that can help you to build what your brand look will what, uh, what your brand will look like within your account um, and how you put that across in your content um, and how you put that across through the colors that you use or the style of text or the messaging that you're sharing in what you write um, and that's how you get your content to work for you um, is using how you want your customers to feel when they come onto your account. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so we're on to the second part um, and that's how you can grow your Instagram followers um, and really build those connections with your following. Okay, so there's two, I'm going to break it down into two areas, but basically it's scheduling and the um, interaction and how you're interacting with your customers and how you're scheduling your posts. I'm just going to move you because I can, all I can see is you, Olaf, and you, oh. <laughs> it's just kind of floating around the screen. <laughs> move me wherever you want. Um, so scheduling your content. Um, the reason, the, the benefits of scheduling is um, a lot of people seem to do their content as a sort of spur of the moment type thing. They'll have an idea, 
um, they'll head over to Instagram, they'll post something that day and they'll come away. Um, the reason why scheduling is really important is <clears throat> when you're creating your posts, you, you, you come up with a plan. Um, so you're never kind of um, posting too many posts of the same kind of content at once, um, which can be very easily done when you're doing it sort of off the cuff and just going with the flow. Um, so you can plan it out better. So basically, for instance, when I was saying about um, sharing posts that have more, uh, that customers want more of, um, you can do this through scheduling. Um, you can sort of put pop in there um, three or four posts that are filtered and spread out evenly. And then in the gaps, fill them with the posts that don't do so well, but are, are important posts. Um, and basically create a nice steady flow of ones where people can engage and the ones that are important that you need. Um, it's also really helpful when you're scheduling because it makes sure that you keep your branding the same because you can clearly see that the branding is staying the same throughout your posts, which you can't do if you're going on and just throwing something out on, onto your social media account. Um, and it also helps you to speed up your content creation time overall because if you're not sort of sat there umming and ahhing, you know what your plan is, you know how to put, piece it all together and um, you're using your branding guidelines to create and to make sure that the post is branded. Um, so it does speed it up overall and keep it consistent. Um, <laughs> I'll get you to, yeah. Um, yeah, so I kind of said it, but basically it's to make sure that you, you don't have any repetition of your posts. Um, I do see this a lot. People who kind of don't have a schedule plan, um, they'll pop a post out and then a few days later, they actually end up popping out a post very similar or exactly the same because they haven't realized that they've already shared that. Um, so there's no repetition in the text or the messaging. Um, so you basically looks like you're constantly sharing new content all of the time. Um, and that's how you keep it flowing um and making sure that you're sort of covering a wider variety of all the key areas within your business um and what your customers wish to know so when you're like kind of piecing your schedule together um and say there's certain topics that you want them to know that week you can sort of list those out and then pop them into relevant posts so you can have your five posts there um, and make sure that each post covers the key areas that you want your customers to know that week. Um, and, and make sure that it's, it's very clear in everything that you're doing. Um, and then obviously add the branding in. <laughs> yeah, um, another important part of scheduling is making sure that you never miss key dates. Um, and this is huge because um, there's uh, so many times where business will be like, oh no, I've forgotten this date. Um, had they been scheduling, they would have not missed the date. So when you're putting a schedule together, um, when I'm doing it for myself, what I do is I um, do it on a monthly basis and any key dates that I have for that month, I make sure that I write it down and that I'm aware of, that's for myself. Um, and then um, any key dates that are happening within like the wider social media calendar or community. Um, so, so for example, like Black Friday is coming up soon, um, making sure that you're aware of this and you start planning for this so that you kind of don't get left behind. Um, it's really important. And that's something that you can do through scheduling your posts because you are planning in advance and making sure that you're covering everything and then you never have to miss anything. Um, and yeah, so, and yeah, I've, I mean, I've already said it, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, move on to interaction. Um, Again, interaction is another key area of growing your business. It's probably one of the most vital. And I think it's a big one that lots of people kind of forget about. Um, they interact on their own accounts. 
this is important um, making sure that you're responding to um, I'll just get you to click sorry Olaf um, making sure that you're um, responding to all comments on all of your posts um, all the messages that come through your business um, and and building it helps you to build a strong connection basically with your customers and following because they feel like you're present and they feel like you care um, and by constantly interacting with them, they will constantly interact with you as well in return and support you. Um, and that's what you want them to do because you, you want to, you know, for authentic organic growth of your social media accounts, you're gonna rely heavily on your following and your customers to um, support you and share your business and engage with you and interact with you to keep you, um, by, uh, visible within Instagram and Facebook um, and to also physically share your the word of mouth about your business and basically shout about your brand as they say um, yeah interacting yeah so I basically said that <laughs> but the um, commitment and it's commitment and loyalty and it's having that loyalty towards you and the brand that I was working with um the, the way that they, they've they got so much commitment and loyalty from the people that, that support them. And it's been through hard work um, by constantly interacting with the people to the point where we'd even message them if it was their birthday because we took all their birthday dates in advance when we first initially spoke to them. Um, and they felt, you know, it's a personal connection. Um, and that's how they support the, the brand that I work with is because there's that loyalty and commitment and they feel like they really have a connection with you. Um, so it's it's basically spending a lot of your time talking to people um, and building relationships. Uh, and that's key. Um, the other part of it is, um, I'm just gonna get you to move on <laughs> sorry um the other part of it is you physically going out into instagram and um finding people to interact with that hit your target audience um the reason to do this is because you are constantly looking for, you're constantly building connections with new people new potential customers um and the difference between doing this authentically and organically to using paid ads is that when a um, when a customer or a follower finds you through um, Facebook ads, they're not building any connection with you. Um, they're simply finding you or stumbling across you. When you have gone out there um, and engaged with them and brought them to you, and they're, they're much more likely to hang around. They're much more likely to build loyalty with you and support you. And they're much more likely to go on to buy from you because they've built that connection with you right from the off. Um, and that's the difference between using ads and doing it yourself. Um, the way you can do this yourself is by commenting and liking um, on posts that are shared by other people who fit your target audience um, in the hope that basically when you comment and they see your handle, they will click through to your own account. And if you've covered all the basis and the grounds that we've spoke about previously with the consistency and your branding and your posts, um, if it fits what they like and they like what they see, they're likely to hang around and find out more about you. Um, the other way you can do it is through um, interacting with other businesses. Um, the reason for doing this is that you're building connections there um, with other small businesses um, so they can relate to you as much as you can relate to them, you know, and if you can build a support network of businesses that share you, you and, and their target audiences are similar maybe not your product or service is too similar, um, but you can connect into their audiences and use them as well. And they can likewise do the same with you. So you can kind of share your customer bases um, and that's quite a nice way of doing it. Um, and the final way and a very effective way, but also quite time consuming, but definitely worthwhile is searching relevant hashtags to your business. 
Um, so basically the best way to do this is using hashtags that are the same or similar to the ones that you're using within your posts. Um, but going out into them yourself, searching them in the, the search bar on Instagram and um, make sure you click on the most recent tab um, and basically scroll through the posts and drop your name by commenting on some potential customer posts um, and liking a few of their pro posts. And that's basically you drop in knowledge of your business onto them because they'll see your handle, they'll like that you've commented and made a, a connection there with them and they're likely to go on and follow you and find out more about you. Um, so yeah, interaction, just key in everything. Um, the, another vital part of doing this is the more you interact and engage within Instagram and Facebook, the more Instagram and Facebook like you. Um, so the higher they rank you within algorithms and things anyway. So if you're hitting your branding and you're hitting your consistency, you're scheduling your posts so that your insights like do this um, and you're interacting, you're much likely to be seen within Instagram naturally than you would have been before. I get you to click. <laughs> So again, if you want, you can um, sort of answer these questions for yourself. Um, and basically you can write down what days and times will you post? Um, when are you likely to be, um, I, I don't, what, I don't know, sorry, Orleth, I don't know what you've put with the IC. <laughs> oh, your, your ideal client. Oh yeah. When, um, I, sorry, when are you, when is your like ideal client going to be online? When are they using Instagram um, and Facebook? So for instance, um, for a, for the, for the uh, baby brand that I was working with, um, obviously their parents, their target audience is parents. Um, so a lot of the time they used to post their posts at 2 40 PM. Um, because, most people at that time of day or around that time of day are just jumping in their car to go and pick their kids up from school or nursery or preschool, um, or they're already sat waiting to pick their children up. And most people, when they get to the school or they're walking to school or nursery to pick up their child, they're on their phones. So that's the most convenient time of day for parents to be online, that or after like seven o'clock, half past seven. Um, so they're the best times of day for that brand. So when are your clients most likely to be online? When is the best time for you to share your posts for your customers to see it? Um, and what days will they be using social media? Um, you know, most parents aren't necessarily going to be using their um, social media at weekends because they've got their kids around. Um, they're much more likely to use it during the weekdays, for instance. Um, what interests do your target audience have? Um, you know, try and appeal to them, try and um, zone in on that. Um, you know, so think about what interests your target audience would have and make sure that you're scheduling posts that are either of value to them or of interest to them, um, because that's what's gonna make them hang around on your account and continue to follow you, um, is what you're offering them or what appeals to them in interest. And the last one is um, to list three memorable social, social media interactions that you've had with others. So basically have a think um, and think about if there's any kind of interactions you've had with other accounts that are stuck out in your mind. Um, how did they interact with you? Was it through a message? Um, what did they say? Um, and basically write that down and try to recreate what they did to make you feel that way when you're talking and interacting with your own clients and your own following. Um, because if it stands out in your mind for you um, and then you go on to do similar things yourself, it's likely that it's gonna stand out in the minds of your clients and your customers. Okay. I can't see. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Zoe, for sharing that. And thanks for everyone for being so patient with us as we got used to the new Zoom webinar. Thank Zoe, absolutely is amazing. And um, we're going to move on to some QA now. And it's just a reminder of everything that we've covered so far today, because I know there was a lot to take in. So we touched on crafting an authentic message, 
becoming oversubscribed in your business and knowing before you spend your valuable time on Instagram and social media, before you, you know, invest in absolutely everything that needs to be done is knowing what your goals are, knowing how many customers you want to achieve, you know, based on your turnover and based on how many people you can convert into customers, how many engaged followers and build your business that way rather than thinking it's all about the numbers. It's about the right quality of people because as Zoe says, it's engagement in the Instagram, the consistency and growth. Um, so I'm going to stop the share now and we have a few minutes for a Q&A. And if anybody would like to ask any questions, could you pop them in the chat and we'll go through as many of those as we possibly can. So I'll just do the screen share. Perfect. So absolutely. Thank you to everyone. I've got the chat open. Um, so can anybody pop in your chat um, what questions you've got? Anyone got any for us? Oh, one new message. Thank you. Um, so Lee has asked a question first about Instagram stories, Zoe. Can you only post an ad to one story a day? Oh, no, no, you can post as many as you like. Um, there's literally no limit on how many stories you can post. Um, my mind does vary. Sometimes I post like three or four um, and other days I'll post hundreds. Um, not literally, but just. <laughs> um, but it's as many as you like, just so long as there's something always there. So there's, an, you know, there's something for people to be um, to interest, interested in um, and a reason why people are on your account every day and continually keeping up that engagement. Um, because by viewing your stories, um, that's, that's them engaging with your account. Um, so the, mo the more you can put stories out, the more you can put posts out, the more engagement you're going to get. Perfect. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Lee. Um, Norma's asked, is there, um, uh, what's, what's quickly, what's the best Instagram we should follow for inspiration on consistency, the best possible branding and just been an all around good guy? Um, yes, yeah, so I think basically the ones that I, oh, hang on a minute. Um, I sent them to all of the other night. So the ones that I like, it's definitely um, Nom Nom Kids um she definitely shows consistency she posts every day she posts on the stories and um, she's got a lovely account um she's a, a, a mom herself and she's grown her following on her own um, and done it all on her own she's really lovely to follow um i'm trying to think who else i another one is um lorella mommy uh, no lorella mama um, again, she's another mum that set up her own business. Um, she does really well on Facebook and does well on Instagram as well. Um, her consistency there is is always there. She posts all the time um, on her stories and her branding is spot on as well. Perfect. So they're probably my two. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And um, Meg has asked, if you choose to post during the working week only, is it okay as a business to then effectively switch off from Friday to Monday a.m. and not to do any post stories or interacting? Um, yeah, the, it's perfectly fine because again, it's the consistency. So if that's what you're doing every week, that that's fine for you as your business. Um, Instagram and, and Facebook will not knock you down for doing that. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely fine. The only thing you might want to do is pop a couple of stories up just again so that you can't there's something constantly there perfect thank you we do have another question i'm just going to grab that um these are amazing questions because you forget it's the little things that add up that all make an absolute difference to everything um so sorry i've got another one um so in terms of the getting to the first, if we look at like the milestones for growing an Instagram account. So most people have become like first 1000, then like first 5000, like in that elusive, you know, 10,000 swipe up. Do you do anything differently to go from 1000 to 5000 to 10,000 or is everything what you've mentioned here tonight? No, literally there's nothing you would do differently um, because um, it, it, it's, the, it's the consistency um, that keeps it going. Um, and each time you stop, you're stopping that flow of consistency and each time you do stop it's harder to get going again so if you can just keep on climbing up that mountain and keep on going you will steadily get hit towards it um, and also 
the more following you're building, the more and, and, and they're engaged, um, the more they'll share you. And basically that kind of doubles on itself over time as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, Meg has asked if you want to start bringing everything in line with branding, feel and tone is should you go back and delete archive older posts? Um, no, I wouldn't do that. There's no need to do that. It shows um, your brand story, um, the journey that you've been on. Um, and so they can see, you know, if you're going to start consistently doing your branding, that they will see that over time. So I wouldn't necessarily say go and delete old posts. Okay. Um, if anything, it's good because it's, it shows that your business has been around quite a while. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Two more questions we're going to take from Nye and from Liz. Um, nice question is, what is, it, what is your advice when you are just starting on your social media journey? Um, my best advice is to uh, stay motivated. Um, even when you're not seeing a, a fast flow of results, um, just remember that with social media, um, unless you want to pay loads of money on Facebook ads, um, if you want to do it so that you can carry on successfully growing um, it takes a lot of time and it's steady so it you'll start off slow um but the more and more work you put in the, the quicker you'll get there and eventually it will happen <laughs> perfect um liz has asked i mean liz has asked about where do uh, lives fit in the algorithm um yeah so lives sort of fall under everything else so your lives when you're doing lives people are interacting on them they're commenting on them they're liking them um they're you posting so they they fall into it too um and i'll be a big part of it so literally anything that you are doing on social media will help with the algorithm issue um so yeah, <laughs> yeah perfect we're still getting more questions and so i'm going to answer them but i i, I missed some um what do you do so if to post reels christina and to post stories christina to answer your question you can use like later and apps like that so there's definitely apps available so you can schedule your stories and um, tia's asked do you create all your posts in canva or somewhere else do you use apps to make your stories more interesting um i use canva um there's not really much else i use um there's not really much else that you need to use particularly i don't think um you know if you want to create um videos you can now do that in canva as well so re realistically just canva basically it's probably the best thing and um sorry simona did ask about her stories are a bit sporadic and how you basically make those like that shop front like that you're always open what advice would you have people to go from i'm sporadically posting stories to they're a consistent shop front um basically <laughs> the best advice i could give you is to take a few days off um and collect photos and things um and basically have like a bank that you store and then just filter those out gradually um and yeah just kind of create yourself a bank of stories that you can put out kind of schedule your stories like you schedule your posts um you know, there needs to be something go out every day on your stories and try and make sure that there is um you know if you if your weekends are more interesting than your weeks then um collect all your photos from the weekend and post them as though they've been you've been doing that each day rather than just on the one day <laughs> thank you and um, i think that bodes really well for mums because there's only so much excitement you can have during lockdown that <laughs> Oh my God. Um, and last question from Susan, which I think is a really important one, is everyone's talking about reels at the moment. Um, so Susan obviously has a business account and not a creator account, so she doesn't have the music option. Are reels worth doing without music? Uh, yeah, you can make them work without music, I would say. Reels are quite new to me as well, so I'm finding my feet with them. Um, but I've, I've watched a lot of them to try and figure them out. And I think you could definitely make them work without music. You could add text in um, and changing the pictures quite quickly um, and there's there's definitely ways in which you can make them stand out even without music to be honest half the time as a mum um i'm listening to stuff without my sound on anyway um simply because i don't want my children going what are you watching what are you watching <laughs> so. perfect um oh sorry laura's popped up the question what is the difference between a creator and a business account um, yeah, so the, so creator is basically um, 
it's like Facebook's own scheduling system. Um, so you can plan all your posts in there and you can schedule your posts for Facebook. Um, and then I think the um, business account, which is what I've got, is um, you can see all your insights. Um, it tells you how well your posts are doing, how well your followers are doing. And I think that's part of the ad manager account as well. So you can sort of um, do all your ads and things as well through it. Um, so I definitely recommend having the business account option if you've got a, a Facebook page that's a business. Perfect. Um, we'll end it there because we have gone like 20 minutes over and I just want to thank everyone. We still have pretty much everyone still on the call. So absolute huge, huge thank you. Um, we will be doing more of these events. We're hell bent on getting everyone just totally motivated and totally ready. So next month we will be glitch free because we will be back again. Um, and we will be talking about like creating your content for 2021. And it's going to be more interactive. We're going to get you actually creating those campaigns and creating your content plan. And we're getting some lovely feedback. And tomorrow we're going to do that competition and we'll let you know who has won the free ticket to our next event. Um, we will will have um, a recording of this. My heart skipped a beat there when I was like, I cannot see my normal recording button, but it's a webinar. I can see it now. So that's amazing. We'll have a recording and a recap of all of the questions from our workbook. And then you can go through this at your leisure. But just one final plea is um, to take action and to take consistent action, but action in line with your business goals. You know, if your goal is to use Instagram to get X amount of followers, to convert into X amount of customers, to then upsell to them, keep doing that. But please go to Paris. Don't look at it on Google Maps, like really, really go there and take consistent action. Um, thank you, Zoe, is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Um, no, just, uh, yeah, thank you. And I really, really hope that it was helpful. Um, yeah, and that you got lots out of it and the the, the thank yous and the comments are lovely. So <laughs> thank you for those as well. Yay. Perfect. Everyone have an absolutely amazing night. We will post in the groups um, soon and we'll let you know about those winners. Thank you so, so much. Um, bye for now. Bye. bye.